right. Looks like we've got kind of critical mass and can go ahead and start. Uh, so hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Lindsay Hoyt. I am Director of Admission at Reed, and we have one of our history professors and chair of the department, David Garrett, here to, joining us to talk to you all about uh, the history major and department. So I want to run through some quick logistics of the, off, the, the virtual office hour here. Um, so we are recording the session. So if you can, for all of your questions, if you can go ahead and put them in the chat rather than unmuting, uh, just put them in the chat and we will get to those questions and we'll be able to have a great conversation uh, about the history department. So thanks for spending some time with us today. Hopefully this will be really helpful to help you learn more about Reed and about the department. And I'm going to throw it over to David to let him introduce himself and talk to you a little bit about uh, history at Reed. Well, hello and welcome. Again, I'm David Garrett. Um, I've been teaching at Reed for about, oh Lord, more than 25 years. Um, and I'm currently the chair of the history department. I also teach in the humanities program and I'm the department's Latin American historian. Um, my research specialty are the colonial Andes based primarily in Cusco and the Titicaca Basin, 17th and 18th century sort of social, political and ethno history. Um, but because Reed is small, I teach all around Latin America. I teach a lot of modern classes on the Mexican Revolution, U.S. Latin American relationships, um, sort of the historiography of labor in Latin America. I also do some older, early modern stuff, like um, class on the Incas, class on sort of Catholicism and um, in the sort of 16th, 17th century um, Spanish world. So anyways, the department itself, um, there are nine of us uh, on the faculty. Uh, in terms of geographic field, we have permanent positions in United States history, uh, European history, Latin American history, East Asian history. And we've had an ongoing visiting um, professor of sort of North African um, and the Arabian world um, uh, history. In terms of themes, um, we cover pretty much everything. I think we do um, uh, environmental history. Uh, we're a central part of the environmental studies program, gender history, race and ethnicity, also diplomatic and legal history, intellectual history, um, economic and social history. So kind of whatever your sort of interest topically is, we'll probably have classes that cover it. The history department is part of the division of history and social sciences. Um, that's a division with five departments, history, anthropology, economics, sociology, and political science. Um, we're a fairly tight division because we're all disciplines that study human society. Um, and because of that, we require that you do field work in two social sciences other than the one you're majoring in. And I mention that just because it makes it really easy your first and second years to kind of explore and think, do I want to be an anthropology major or a history major or a political science major? That's all fine because the courses you take will actually count your major, whichever department they're in, um, up to two of each. And so the history department is also absolutely central to the college's humanities program. Um, I would argue basically history is central to anything that involves the study of humanity. Um, and so with that, um, we're also a central component in a lot of interdisciplinary programs so that you can basically study history and work with a uh, historian on your senior thesis and major in several kind of affiliated interdisciplinary majors like environmental studies, critical race and ethnicity studies, American studies, history and literature, um, international and comparative policy studies, all of those have history variant majors attached to them. Um, the other thing I'd say about history is the study of history tends to be based on studying elective things. So we have a program where we do have a couple of required courses that tend to be the, the more advanced, our junior seminar which is required before the thesis. Otherwise, most of our classes are just open um, and they're elective, they're one semester long and they're based on different topics, times and places. So there's not a really step progression where you have to start with first year history, second year history, third year history, um, which again means that we have students from around the college who are not history majors taking a lot of our classes. And it also allows a lot of, I would say, flexibility 
in the major. Um, trying to think, assume some of you want to know about requirements and all, but I think I might wait to see if there are any questions about that. Um, and um, yeah, Lindsay, should we just sort of open to questions a little? Absolutely. Yeah. Y'all go ahead and start putting your questions in the chat. If you've got anything that you know that you want to hear a little bit more about, please let us know, throw those in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, as y'all think about that and put some questions in the chat for us, uh, David, can you tell me a little bit about um, what you think maybe sets this department ap apart uh, from our, you know, similar departments at other peer institutions? Is there anything that you think really makes the Reed experience, especially in history, special? Oh, I think, you know, so um, a couple of things I would say set us apart from our peer institutions and then also sort of set, I would say, just liberal arts colleges apart. One thing is like all of the classes at Reed, um, our history classes are based on the conference method. Um, so class is about anywhere from eight to 24 is our maximum. So we'll see usually about 15, 16 people sitting around a table discussing texts um, and discussing both sort of primary texts, um, historical works, but also really focusing on the study of that. So what we call historiography, works by historians, um, and analyzing them um, and thinking about how you study the past. One thing I would say that sets, I don't want to set us apart necessarily from all others, but it's really the focus of our pedagogy. Um, and it should be sort of um, ontological and metaphysical. The past doesn't actually exist anymore. It's gone. Um, the History is not just trying to know the facts about what happened. It's really trying to think about how we can create and think about um, questions and methodologies by which we might know something about the past. So one thing you will never get in a read history class is sort of memorizing dates and details and just sort of that kind of rote memorization test. I wanna stress that's really important to history, but that's just something you do. Um, what you'll focus on in all of our classes are really questions about how we go about studying the past, um, sort of arguments, how you put them together. And then you'll think about the arguments themselves, the claims that people make about the past, how solid are those claims? Um, what kind of evidence do they have to support them? How do various claims fit together to give you a larger picture and understanding of sort of larger historical processes? So in that sense, intellectually, that's how we conduct history. And again, it's extremely um, based on kind of collaboration, conversation, much more than sort of lectures and memorization. Um, and so that would be one sort of, you will never have a 120 person survey lecture class. Um, it's always sort of based on a conversational model. Um, yeah, that would be the thing. And the other, of course, is the senior thesis. Um, I mean, other schools have them too. I don't want to say we've invented that, but it is sort of very, very distinctive about Reed that the culmination of your career is going to be a year long project where you work with a professor um, and you produce a kind of a thesis, which is a pretty standard way of approaching history. That is, say, you study a topic, you study the literature about it, you look for sort of both primary evidence, that is evidence from the time period you're studying um, and the place you're studying, things produced at the time, and then the secondary literature about what scholars have said about it. And then you make your own argument and engaging both with primary historical evidence and with scholarly debate and produce, you know, a complicated sort of argument document that probably runs about 70, 80 pages. Um, it's a year's worth of work. Um, I would say both it's great for history um, and sort of learning about the past. It also just in, um, inculcates within you a lot of really enormously useful skills about how you sort of define a topic, how you learn about it, how you decide what's good information, bad information, how you synthesize that, how you sort of articulate it and put it together in your own version, how you present it in a way that someone would want to read um, and a way that's useful to other people. Um, and that's sort of, I would say, really the core skill that history teaches. It's about taking a huge array of information, distilling it, synthesizing it, kind of analyzing it and coming up with claims about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that I think is a good segue into Maggie's question here. Um, 
about, you know, the opportunities that there are for students to study topics that aren't necessarily any faculty members particular specialty. I think this is a good question for kind of college in general, right? Um, is, you know, we have all of these incredible faculty members with very specific areas of specialty, but of course they teach a very broad array of, of topics. So can you go a little bit more into those opportunities for students to find their own particular niche interests and get that education? Sure, and one thing, again, at a liberal arts college, I mean, my specialty, what I am actually a, like an expert on, is again, 17th and 18th century South Andean social, cultural, um, uh, ethnic and political history. Um, I teach one or two classes that really have very much to do with that at all, and that's certainly not the focus. I think like most of the Reed faculty, and the, what I love teaching at Reed is it just makes you very broad. I mean, I have learned so much teaching here because I design classes that are not on my specialty. I mean, my favorite class is the um, the new historiography of Latin American labor. Oh, it's a great class. And that's all, well, it's a great historiography, I should say. Um, that's all sort of 20th century Latin American labor history, which is not my specialty. So one is the difference between what we might call a research specialty and the breadth of fields in which people teach is going to be much, much broader. Um, in terms of doing something that there are no classes on, um, you really two options. One, you can work with a professor um, if they're willing to do an independent study. Okay. And I've done a couple of those my time, which are really fun and areas that I don't know much about. I've sometimes I've done independent studies that are really in my specialty, which is very nice. But I've worked with students on literature I don't know. I was like, I'll read along with you on that. And we'll meet once a week and we'll talk about it. And you'll write a kind of synthetic paper. And so independent study is absolutely a formal part of the curriculum. You find a professor who wants to do it and you work on your own on a topic. The second, and certainly in history, um, is senior thesis. Um, we're very clear. I don't want to say you can write on anything you want to write on because we might be like, that's not really a historical topic, but we're really broad. There is a topic that you, know, you have a historical take into that you want to work on and no one works on it. You know, and someone will do it with you. I mean, we'll be very clear. I, I have advised so many theses on things I don't know much about. One of my favorite was sort of on um labor mobilization and unionizing and interracial unions in Birmingham, Alabama, sort of big southern steel city. Um it, throughout the 20th century, really from like the foundations of the industry in 1900 up through the Civil Rights Act. I mean, it was a great thesis and I had learned so much. Um so when you're working with someone on a field that's not their specialty, I'll tell people like the burdens on you. You have to do a lot more work on sort of introducing me to the historiography. I'll do my share. Um, but there is certainly ample room for you to study topics that you want to that no professor is actively working on in collaboration with a professor. Um, and I would say one thing broadly about the college, I always think of Humanities 110, our introductory humanities class, which covers, you know, sort of the ancient Mediterranean world, Tenochtitlan and Mexico City and the Harlem Renaissance. There is no one alive who is an expert on all of this, okay? There are very few people who are expert on any of them. And part of the model is that scholarship learning um, is actually a very collaborative process. It's not about learning from the expert. Um, and I think we take that absolutely to heart in the history department. Um, I mean, I'm certainly a trained historian and I can provide a lot of guidance and I know a lot of history, but, um, I and I think most of my colleagues are very willing to work in areas that we're not that knowledgeable about. Those, again, will be fairly individual projects. So can you tell us a little bit about, uh, Samuel was asking about flexibility. So what you mean by flexibility within the major? Uh, and then also, uh, you know, are there double majors, I think is is what Samuel is asking, uh, that students can do um, at Reed. Okay, you can do a double major if you want. That means you are doing two majors and writing two the senior theses. Um, one or two people a year might do that. Many end up taking an extra semester and starting their second senior thesis while they're finishing their first one. Um, but no, basically we now have a series of minors. There is not a history minor, but there are a lot of other minors in the college. So you can now do minors and that's a fairly new innovation. 
we offer certainly ad hoc interdisciplinary majors. That is, if you wanted, say, to write, um, uh, oh, a perfect example would be like a history music. You know, sure. No, and we have a, there's a superb, wonderful guy, some music historians in the music department. Um, and if you were sort of wanted to cobble together a major, and the reason you would do that would be to not have to meet all of the specific history department and history and social science divisional major requirements, nor meet all of the specific music and art um, division requirements, but to come up with something between the two. Um, again, you would have to have faculty buy-in and get approval, but uh, quite a number of people do ad hoc interdisciplinary majors. And again, as I was saying, the history department itself, um, there are established formal lines to be an environmental studies history major, uh, comparative race ethnicity studies history major, um, an international comparative policy studies history major, okay, American studies history, uh, history and lit history, but that's sort of redundant. So, um, right, so they're both formal interdisciplinary programs and you can put together your own major. Again, double majoring, um, is yeah, 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 people do it, but but you should be very aware it is at this point about writing two theses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, that's why we've built you know these interdisciplinary majors and these opportunities for for students to combine two of their big major interests without having to go through the whole process of writing two theses. Um, so you mentioned you talked about this a little bit, David, but we do have a question. The next very next question is about the history literature program. So can you tell us a little bit more about the structure of those kinds of programs and how they work? Right. So I mean, you can look them up in the catalog. They just have a slightly different. So I will say, to be a history major, you are required, in addition to the college whatever requirement, um, it basically takes your senior thesis and ten classes, and the ten classes are six history classes. Okay. You get to choose whatever you want with certain guidelines. One has to be the junior seminar. We have a junior seminar each semester, so you can take it in the fall or the spring. And those are on different topics. I'm doing it right now, and it's on basically history writing in 16th century Mexico. Um, so it's just wonderful. There are all of these Nahuatl or indigenous language histories of the Aztecs and of the war between the Spanish and the Tlaxcalans and the Mexica and others. Um, and there are a lot of Spanish sources. There are a lot of um, kind of encyclopedic sources put together by alliances between um, uh, indigenous Mexica and Spanish friars. So we're kind of looking at those. Last semester, Jackie Dirks, my colleague, did the junior seminar on, um, I think, American society in the 1970s. So you always have two. One's usually a U.S., one's something else. One's generally modern, one's early modern. And you need to take a class in U.S. history, a class in European history, a class in a non-U.S. or European field, and then you need to take a class before 1800 and after 1800. Okay. Um, other than that, you can take whatever you want. And so um, in addition to that, you need to take two classes in two other social sciences. That's, the, again, the history social science requirements. So that can be two anthropology, two poli sci, two sociology, two econ. You need two of those sets. And you need to take one of the upper level humanities 200 level cycles. So a year of um, sophomore humanities. Um, if you do an interdisciplinary major, for example, for history and literature, the requirements for history classes, for literature classes and competency in a foreign language. And ideally you have to put together a program so it's not for random history classes, for random literature classes. They're things that kind of go together. And again, central to that is competency demonstrated um, through classwork in a foreign language. And also, you need to take the 200 level Hume class. You don't need to take the social sciences for history and literature. For environmental studies, you don't need to do the humanities, but you need to take some sciences as well. Um, for international comparative policy studies, you don't need to do the humanities, I think, could be wrong on that. Um, but you need to take certain designated classes in both history and the other social sciences that focus on international relations or policy. Okay. So again, specifically for history and literature, it's for history, for lit, competency in a foreign language, and the 200 level Humes plus your senior thesis. 
But for all of these interdisciplinary programs, they're basically variations on the history major requirements. Environmental studies and comparative race and ethnicity studies have um, required classes in the major. So there's a 200 level environmental studies class and a 300 level. You take one first or second year and the second junior year. And those you have to take if you're an ES history major. Again, so um, and similarly with uh, created comparative race and ethnicity studies, they're just instituting sort of core required classes in that program in addition to history. And to do that, you take fewer other non-history requirements. So as you're talking, about, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Did you have? Oh, one thing I was going to say, but I don't know if someone had asked about flexibility. Part of the flexibility of the history program is to take the junior seminar, you need to have taken two history classes. But that's the only class really that has prerequisites other than um, some of our classes you have to have taken HUME 110. You need to be a sophomore because we want to make sure you've had the writing background. We have a lot of classes open to first year students. Um, because there's no progression, you don't get stuck into the, oh, I can't take this class because I didn't take the prerequisite. So I would say our major is very flexible in that we have usually about 12 classes every semester and you just kind of put them together. Um, and that means you don't run into bottleneck problems in the history major. It also means that um, we're a major that is to study abroad one semester is absolutely no problem. Um, if you'd like to study abroad a whole year, that's no problem, except emphasize this. If you are interested in studying abroad for an entire year, when you meet with your advisor before classes in August, before you start your first year, tell them and plan your schedule around it. I'm doing the junior seminar. I have three sophomores in it, second semester who are great. They're all going abroad for the year next year. And they planned on that. And I just, I'm fine. It's like, that's no problem. You've taken two history classes. You want to do a sophomore year. They're doing the junior qualifying exam sophomore year and going away. We have students who will go away for all the sophomore year. No problem if you've planned it freshman year. So the history major is, I think, particularly conducive if you're interested in sort of study abroad. So your answers keep leading me perfectly into my next question. Uh, so I was going to ask you about kind of with all this flexibility that you're describing and these um, interdisciplinary studies and majors, um, there's a lot of choices to be made. So can you talk a little bit about what the advising looks like and how we help students kind of think that plan through and make those choices? Oh, yeah, so you'll be assigned a first year advisor who you'll meet with before you register for classes. Um, and with that person, basically, you'll talk through what you're interested in majoring in, what your long-term goals are, how you can try to put together. I mean, first year registration is just is not rocket science. Like you're taking Hume 110. Your advisor will urge you to take care of some of your distributional requirements um, and to maybe take an exploratory class in a couple of majors you're interested in. But then once you get sort of through that, um, and again, if you have very specific goals, like, oh, no, no, I want to be this complicated interdisciplinary major. Okay, we need to work on that. I want to study abroad for a year, plan around that. Um, and other things, if you have real interests that are extracurricular, it's like, that's a priority to me. Talk to your advisor, figure out the best we can to accommodate it. Um, and you meet with your advisor, um, you know, at least once a semester before you register for classes. Um, your academic advisor is really the person who's there um, to kind of help guide you, to run interference if there's a problem, to just sort of be in touch with. Um, I get all the comments from my students. Um, you're evaluated informally after eight weeks of class. And so people are having some concerns, I'll get in touch. Um, your first year advisor will probably not be in your major. They might be, um, but often, you know, you're undeclared, you change your mind. And so you can change your advisor at any point. Um, you just need to fill out a really simple form and you need to get the new advisor to be, to be your advisor. I often teach in Humanities 110. Um, I'm not this year, I'm teaching in one of the upper level ones, but oh, at the end of first year, I usually become advisor for like five of my Hume students because I'm just like, oh, you know, they don't know what they want to do. They've only met their advisor once. Their advisor is going on sabbatical next year. It's like, sure, I know you. And so 
by the end of your first year, you'll probably have relationships with faculty, you know, in the department you're interested in, and certainly by the end of your sophomore majoring in, and then usually you'll ask them to be your advisor. And then you'll start getting much more sort of, you know, I don't say more hands-on, but more really guiding you through the major. So I guess that your first year um, advisor is really getting you established to meet the college requirements, to get you comfortable, um, to be there if you're having any issues, pretty much anything. Again, as I say, I've been here forever. I can't solve any problems, but I can probably direct you a little bit to someone who might be able to. Um, and then starting sometime in your sophomore year, you're really encouraged to find an advisor in your major, um, which is, no, I mean, we all advise, it's not a problem. Very rarely do people say, I will not be your advisor. You'll always find an advisor. Um, and then that person is going to kind of help guide you through the major. And then in the history department, and different departments do it differently, your senior thesis advisor will be your senior advisor. So they're just the same person. Um, and that's about getting you through the thesis and graduating you. So let's talk then what comes next? Uh, what do read history majors go on to do once they graduate? And also how do we help them like look for those opportunities and and kind of how do we help guide them as they graduate and go to life beyond read? History, because you are learning general skills, I mean, what history, it is the great generalist field. I mean, that's, that's so much fun. Um, and so, a lot of the skills that you get are so broadly applicable. I mean, historically, I've a lot of people, of course, into graduate school who become history professors. You'll find historians all around the country who want to read. Um, and still, we have quite a few students who do go on to that. Um, we also have a lot of students who go on to teaching sort of in high school, elementary, but basically education pedagogy. Um, also, a really growing field of public history, museums, um, kind of working for institutions and organizations um, that are, again, about uh, uh, monuments, park services, things like that. Said so more and more students go into both working in public history and doing graduate work, especially in like museology, um, you know, studying the work of museums. So those would be kind of the most narrow history, history things. History historically is a huge pre-law major. I mean, if you think about what you're being taught to do, it's like, oh, look at all this information. You're being taught how to write a legal brief, um, basically. So we sent tons of students to law school. Um, we had sent a lot of students into journalism. Again, the same sort of um, strengths about, you know, doing research, organizing, writing it, um, or I say writing nowadays, of course, multimedia. Um, Beyond that, um, we have lots of people who are interested in different things who are major in history. And so, I mean, I've had pre-med history majors, very standard. Um, we have a lot of students who go into public advocacy, um, very interested in history. Again, this is a study of society, so great for that. Um, yeah, I would say we have students who go into politics. Um, there unless you are planning on going into a field where a very specific education is required to enter. Um, and even again with med school, we have pre-med history majors. That's, boy, tell your advisor <laughs> the first thing that you want to do that. And you have to arrange your classes and be careful. And if you want to do a year abroad and be a history major and be pre-med, good luck. Um, but if you sort of are working with your advisor, totally can make that work. If you want to go on and do advanced work in physics, I have a lot of physicists in my classes, but I would say that's not a good history major thing to do, if that makes sense. But if you're really talking about just this um, skills of how to kind of do research and present it and analyze things, um, any field that relies on that history sends into, and we have graduates in almost all of them. Um, in terms of what we do, um, one is we try to network with our graduates and current students. Um, past couple of years, every year we've done a, um, now that we do things on Zoom, it's great, a uh, meeting kind of like this, but where we have graduates in a field, um, we did this year was on law. Um, and so 
current students talking to recent graduates who are finishing law school, who are in legal careers. And then we did one last year on journalism. Um, and so people who you know are practicing journalists um, across the different media, um, just talking to students about how you do it, setting up like that. And then of course, Reed has the um, uh, Center for Life Beyond Reed, which is our career services and more than that. And they work very actively with students um, you know, as you're trying to decide what you want to do as a career and how you try to find entree into that field. And we had a question about pre-med and made, and uh, being a history major. So thank you for covering that already when it's not having to go through it. Um, yes, I've, had, I've had two, they were both great. So um, it definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a question about the junior qual. So can you tell us about what how the junior qualifying exam is structured when they take it, all of that kind of stuff? Oh, yes. So the main thing is for history, just don't worry about it. Um, the junior qualifying exam is a requirement of the college all departments, all programs, you must take one. Um, for us, what we're really interested in is the junior seminar, which is also a requirement for us, because the junior seminar teaches you how to define a topic, do research on it to find, again, primary sources, that is to say, evidence from the time and place you're looking at, see the claims you can make, what's being produced around that. And then the secondary, the kind of later historical arguments about it. Um, and to do that research and then to write like a 25 page paper about it. And as I always tell my students, see, the thesis is kind of two or three junior seminar papers put together. If you can do the, that, you can do the thesis and you're fine. Um, the junior qualifying exam exists kind of to make sure that students can do the thesis. So our junior qualifying exam is part of, i be careful. Formally, it is not part of the junior seminar because your junior qualifying exam cannot be part of the junior seminar, according to college rules. Um, our junior qualifying exam is administered during the junior seminar. And basically, you read an academic article, you summarize the arguments about it and the methodology, and then you kind of engage with an evaluation of it. Okay, so very straightforward. Um, and yeah, I we're... We occasionally have students who like, like, eh, that wasn't that good. So we'll work with them and they'll do it again until they get it right. Um, we don't fail people out of the major on our junior qualifying exam. Um, you know, if you don't hand in your junior seminar paper, that's a different matter. But um, so for us, the junior qual is part of the junior seminar. The junior seminar is what really matters. And the junior qualifying exam is again, um, showing that you, um, you know how to read an academic article for the argument and for the methodology, like how they are, not just what claim are they making, but what's the evidence they're giving for it? How are they analyzing the evidence? And do you think that that's compelling or do you see some problems with it? Thank you. So can you tell us, we've got a question about um, some recent senior theses. So do you have some descriptors you can tell us about some ones that have stood out to you recently? Sure. I mean, um, and again, I mean, I... In my whole career at Reed, um, which I've probably advised about 100 theses, a few more, I've advised really, I think, one or two that are on my true area of expertise. If you broaden it out a little bit, we might get to three or four. I had a great one years ago on um, kind of indigenista thought um, in, in Malta, this really important avant-garde uh, journal in Lima in the 1920s. Um, and in fact, Eleanor is now a professor of history in um, New York. Um, other ones that kind of focus on Latin America. Oh, a couple of years ago, I had a wonderful knockout one on kind of Mexican art music. So sort of, you know, classical high and um, Mexican music after the revolution. So in the 1920s and 30s, and particularly the attempt to kind of build an indigenista or an indigenous uh, pre-Aztec or Aztec musical canon and the attempt to revive Aztec musical instruments as part of sort of symphony music. Um, and, and a lot of the compositions that were produced were really interesting. Um, I had a wonderful one, this is probably about 10 years ago when I loved, on urban planning in Lisbon after the 1740 earthquake. Um, a beautiful, and, and in fact, um, Grayson actually went to 
New Portuguese went to Lisbon. We have um, funding um, so that you can go to archives um, that you need for your senior thesis, um, usually over winter break. Grayson went to Lisbon and sort of looked at some of the discussion of the plans for rebuilding the city in 1740, thinking about the politics of that, how it created sort of a city, a, a modern city that, where people could also be more easily surveyed and controlled by this sort of absolute monarch that was emerging. Uh, similarly, uh, the Mexican art music um, thesis, um, he went on to Mexico City um, during his winter break senior year to look at archives there about um, the production of music. Um, yeah, I like urban planning. I had a great urban planning one on Sacramento, actually, um, in the sort of foundation period of Sacramento. Um, a couple of years ago, had a really lovely thesis on, um, again, involving research over uh, winter break in Buenos Aires, Montevideo, on the memory museums that have been constructed in the past 20 years in Montevideo and especially in Buenos Aires um, to commemorate the kind of uh, brutality of the military dictatorships that ruled the countries in the 1970s and early 1980s. Um, and thinking about how the two countries have sort of commemorated those episodes quite differently and the politics behind the commemoration and also both the very practical politics, why Uruguay and Argentina have different politics, um, but also kind of the ideological politics and how they were different. Um, yeah, I mean, those would be kind of a sample of the things that people are doing. I'm working right now with a student who's looking very similar to my junior seminar, actually, um, just coincidentally, on... There's been the translation of a lot of Nahua, uh, Nahua is an indigenous central Mexican language, a lot of Nahua historical sources from the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, many of which tell the history of central Mexico, they're Nahua, um, and then also the Spanish ones, and looking really at how the events of the Spanish Mexica War and the um, invasion and sort of destruction of Tenochtitlan and the toppling, toppling of the Aztec Empire. Um, how central events in that, um, central battles are depicted differently um, in different sources and kind of the politics of that, um, what people are trying to commemorate. So that would be a sampling of the theses I've done recently. Yeah, really fascinating. Thank you. Uh, and I did put a link in for you guys to see some more as well, to see some of the recent things that are uh, that are highlighted on the, on the history website as well. Um, so we've had some questions kind of more around, you know, being interested in things that we don't have specialties within in the faculty. Um, so I just wanted to say for y'all, uh, I highly, highly encourage you, not just for Reed, but for any school that you're looking at, you look up the course catalog, go see what classes are offered at any one semester. Now, keep in mind, those are likely going to change from semester to semester, right? So just because something isn't offered this spring doesn't mean we never have any classes around that. But you should be able to look at kind of years and semesters past as well and kind of see what are the types of classes that are generally offered. Um, and then, you know, keep in mind, as David's been saying, you know, when you start working on that thesis process, that's yours. You own that and you're going to be coming up with that topic, you know, certainly with support from your faculty as well. But that's going to be a really great opportunity for you to pick that thing that you are that really niche thing that you're really interested in exploring. Um, and so you you probably are not going to have a faculty member who is an expert in that particular niche thing because that's that's you could that's going to be you right so they're going to help you kind of do that and, and move through that process um, but it's unlikely that you are going to be picking a topic necessarily that's exactly aligned with your faculty member's uh, specialty too. Does that sound right to you, David? Anything else to add? Yeah, no, in a couple of hours, I was just looking at um, some of the comments. Two things I would add is, one thing people tend to think of history very much in terms of place and time. Um, that, oh, we don't have someone who covers, um, we don't have anyone who covers Italy. Well, okay, a million other things too. Um, we don't have, um, we do not have a South Asian historian. Um, we do not have a South Asian um, scholar in the, uh, scholar of South Asia in the anthropology department um, who works on very historical topics. A um, lot of areas we don't cover and a lot of times we don't cover. Um, that said, a lot of history is actually very topical. So that one of the things is to think about is the interest just in a place in time or is it a kind of topical question about it? Um, are your interests about labor? 
or your interests about law, legal system, or your interests broadly about gender, family structure, um, interested in the history of medicine, okay? Then suddenly people have a lot more expertise, if that makes sense, um, because we have someone, a scholar, you know, who does legal history of 16th and 17th century Europe, um, he advises a lot of legal history things that are not on that, are certainly not on that time frame. but it's like, yes, here are questions you need to ask if you're interested in thinking about legal history. Um, if you're interested in thinking about the history of labor, labor organization, actually, there's some kind of fundamental questions you want to think about that are going to be wherever you're looking at it, you need to think about these questions. So in that sense, topically, um, and often when we hook up um, professors, can you, we assign senior thesis advisors right before the beginning of the semester, uh, senior year. And we go through and we talk about them and some are incredibly obvious. It's like, yeah, okay, I'm doing that because I know about that. And others are like, oh, no, I don't know about that, but I know about all the kind of larger, I know a lot of the questions they're going to need to ask. And I know sources about how you ask those questions and the intellectual debates about that topic. And then that will help them, you know, the student focus in on the particular, again, history is the study of the particular within the general. So we'll focus on um, particular questions of, um, yeah, like a student who did a thesis like this the other day, um, a few years ago, on um, educational policy in Hawaii in the 19th and 20th centuries. Hey, we don't have anyone who does that. We have people who work on education. I'm like, okay, that's totally doable. Um, and one question is, is it um, easier or better, um, you know, writing a senior thesis um, where the advisor doesn't know, um, is it more difficult if the advisor doesn't know? I, difficult, I, I wouldn't say that much. It does require in, initiative and incentive. So if you're working on something the advisor really knows, like, well, here, go look at these four or five things. Here's some primary sources. You're gonna have to find a lot of that on your own. Um, I mean, when I advise theses about things I don't know, I will spend, you know, a few hours looking around and trying to acquaint myself with the literature. But th that puts, so in some ways, you know, there's more independence if you're writing on a topic um, which no one's an expert. Like someone's an expert, they'll just like, do this, do this, do this. Um, I don't know if that makes it any easier. Um, but certainly it does require a different degree of kind of direction and yeah, um, going out and doing a lot of the legwork. So, so yeah, we've got about 15 minutes left. I've got a couple more questions for David, but if there's anything else that you want to put in the chat, go ahead and do that now. Um, so there was an earlier question about your specific classes, and you've mentioned some of the, the, the classes that you're currently teaching. And um, so the question was about kind of the syllabus and readings and things like that. So if, yeah, we'd love to hear some about that. But I would also love to hear you talk a little bit about kind of what are your expectations for your students in your class? Um, you know, where, where do those expectations start at the beginning of the semester and, and where do you want them to be? What do you want them to learn and, and uh, have developed those skills that are they're developing through your classes by the end of the semester? Oh, great. Um, yeah, I mean, my expectations are that people kind of do the work. I, mean, I don't think it's excessive, but, you know, do the reading. I didn't mean that very seriously. Um, when you have a conversational model, conversation works well when people have actually spent some time, and I don't mean just skimming over, like read the reading, think about it. That's for the students to do on their own. Um, collaboratively is fine, but I mean, let's say, you know, in their own time. And they come to class saying, oh, you know, these are questions we had about the reading. Um, <clears throat> and especially, again, um, this is true of all the history classes. Why do you think about not just, this is what the article said, and that's really important. I mean, I try not to assign things where I'm like, oh, that was a terrible article. I don't know why anyone would read that um, or a book. So you want to say, oh, this is what they say. But also <coughs> with history, again, the central question, if someone tells you something about the past, the first thing you should always ask is how on earth do they know that? Um, if someone gives you a claim that this is what it was, well, no. Um, give me the evidence. And there will never be enough evidence to make any absolute claim so it's really to think about okay how are they making an argument like what 
what how are they making that argument both in terms of the evidence they are presenting um again i would say do labor history because i'm doing that again soon um there's wonderful historiography of the 1970s 80s 90s it really rethinks how you write about labor um one of the things is what sources do you have from I mean, we're going to talk about people's consciousness how they view their relationship of the labor to capital and to the employer okay show me your sources if you're saying people thought this how do you know do you have journals are you reading pe protests are you reading um oral histories okay how do you read them so that would be the sort of the evidence that you have to make the claim then another question would be always you're going to be informed by some intellectual kind of framework um is this history really emphasizing um sort of people's consciousness is this history really focused more on kind of actual material relationships um that is to say you know um the relationship of individual laborers to the means of production, what rights do they have? Um, is this an analysis that's kind of focusing and focusing on class? How are you describing class? Is it, again, a strictly economic term, or is it sort of the way people think about things? Is it fairly amorphous? Um, how does that inform the strength of the argument that's being made? So those are the things we would look for in reading. Um, and then in terms of the goal would be for, I mean, then, I evaluate through writing, basically, um, occasionally through oral presentations. Um, I think other faculty, um, I'm a little bit of the dinosaur in some ways. I think some are moving to other forms of sort of um, making different kinds of projects. Um, but basically, the media in which you present it will vary. The basic idea that you are both clearly defining a topic, which is hard to do, um, that you are marshalling evidence um, with which to make arguments about that topic, that you're paying attention to what other people say about that evidence and about that topic, um, and that you have an understanding both of what kind of people think the history was, what was happening um, and about what people say about it and kind of big questions that remain. That's what I would hope you get out of a class that I teach. And I think most of us would have that. So I've got one final question for you, David. So uh, you've been teaching at Reed for a long time now. Um, and you know, I'm sure you had choices. You could teach at a lot of different places. So what's kept you here? Why have you stayed at Reed for as long as you have? Oh, well, I love teaching at Reed. I mean, I like teaching at a liberal arts college. Um, because again, of the generalness, I mean, the fact that, you know, I have to learn about topics that I didn't know anything about, um, you know, specialization is the name of the game these days, but I actually find specializations can be incredibly limiting. Um, if you just, you know, if everything I did was just on the 17th and 18th century and, it, um, so I'm really happy. And of course I love teaching in the humanities program because that is all about, how do you engage with things outside of your comfort zone where you're not an expert? How can you have, you know, how can you learn in areas where you don't already know? Um, so I love that. I really like just the, um, I mean, again, this would be true of all liberal arts colleges. I, I like um, small classes. Um, I like, you know, very personal interaction um, where students just come by the office um, and chat, great. Um, so all that I love, um, I really like Reed students. Um, I think one thing that kind of just, since I've gotten here and Reed students have a very, are known for this and it makes it really lovely to teach here. Reed students are just, um, they're interested in intellectual questions. You know, they're, they're, they're this sort of self-selecting group that kind of, you don't have to justify at Reed that you're interested in kind of thought and what people think about and how you think in an orderly way, how you get more information to think more. Um, and, you know, that's just considered like a totally, that needs no justification. Um, and that's kind of how I am. So it's really nice to be in a community where that's what people do, um, where people are like in the library all the time and reading all the time. Um, and so in that sense for the community, yeah, I, I, I guess why I stayed and love it. That's great. Thank you. They're not in the library all the time. They read students have fun yeah. too. <laughs> well, and the other thing, I mean, to be another reason I love read, okay, and this is not necessarily pushing read. Um, I love being in a liberal arts college. 
Reed's a liberal arts college in a really great city, and I really like living in Portland. So, I mean, that's another reason um, a lot of people stick around because, like, Portland's great. So, yeah, absolutely. All right, great. Well, um, thank you so much for for taking the time to chat with us and, and tell us a little bit about the department. Um, and thank you to all the students who joined us today and asked great questions. Uh, David, is there any last thing that you want to say to the audience here? I'm not, I, I have nothing off the top of my head. Um, again, uh, welcome. Uh, I look forward to meeting many of you in person. Um, yeah. And again, if you have specific questions, feel free to reach out. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks uh, to all the students out there and enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Hopefully we're having a beautiful sunny day here in Portland. And I hope you're having a beautiful sunny day wherever you are as well. All right. Thanks y'all. Bye. Bye.